Good morning, good afternoon, good evening everyone. Thank you very much today for joining us as we have a conversation all about how to perform an unbiased loudspeaker shootout. My name is Scott Sugden. I am Product and Technology Outreach Manager here at All Acoustics, and I've brought together a really great panel with us today to talk all about how to do a shootout. Uh, to my uh, above me, to my right, it looks like is uh, Ryan Knox. Ryan, thank you for joining us all the way from Austin, Texas, or Dallas, Texas. Dallas, Texas. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, I, I work with a company called Idebri Consulting, uh, primarily technology, audio, video, acoustics, lighting. Um, my role with Idebri has been for about 18 years of designing um, large sound systems and working on acoustics in tricky spaces. Uh, I kind of got, got into this business by following bands around and driving a truck and <laughs> playing system tech in between driving semis. So, Thank you, Ryan. And Ryan, you've been, been, ride. you've been with IDB for a while and, and you've worked on projects, everything from uh, we've worked together on performing arts centers to now stadiums to uh, I'm assuming churches and uh, university campuses, right? Everything in between? Yes. Yeah. Lots Excellent. of spaces of shared experience. Excellent. And Ryan, uh, you're down in uh, uh, Texas, um, so I guess the most important question is how do you like your barbecue? I, uh, I like barbecue sauce. So the meat has to be good, but the sauce has to be better. There you go. Excellent. Uh, Ryan, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I'm glad you're here. You've been a part of many, many, many shootouts over the years, um, or, or shall we really say uh, competitive performance demos, um, whatever term needs to be used. Uh, Josh Mikeley, Josh, application engineer for L Acoustics, uh, specifically in House of Worship. How are you, Josh? I'm doing really well. Thanks for having me, Scott. Josh, you're in Michigan. Uh, all is well in Michigan. You've had a little bit of rain, I hear. Uh, yeah, we've had a bit of rain. Uh, I hear some dams on the other side of the state have uh, have broken. Luckily, we haven't been affected by that. But, uh, you know, we're finally creeping into the 70s, and uh, so we can finally emerge from our, our dens and enjoy the weather. Good, good. So hopefully the uh, the the winter hibernation weight has uh, burned off, or is it the opposite? I think uh, uh, if I remember right, um, it's uh, great to have you here, Josh. You've been actually a part of competitive listening environments on almost every angle. Is that right? Yeah, pretty interesting. I think uh, I have a, a good reference for this because I've been the end user, uh, I've been the integrator, I've been an owner's representative, and now I'm doing it as a manufacturer. Uh, so I've been able to be on every side of that coin, um, which brings, you know, I, I think I have an interesting perspective of this because of that. Sure. Well, thank you uh, for, for taking the time today. So everyone who's watching us live on Teams, thank you very much for joining us today. If you're in YouTube and watching this, um, don't forget uh, below is the L Acoustics uh, subscribe button. Hit that and you guys will be notified of all the upcoming uh, events we've got uh, when they've been published on YouTube. For those of you live, if you have any questions about a shootout, uh, please don't hesitate to post that into the Q&A. We'll see if we can get an answer during today's uh, conversation. Uh, if not, we'd love to, to respond to you guys via social media, via Facebook, via YouTube, via Instagram. So thank you everyone for joining us today live and for those of you watching at home. Um, so I guess the very first question, uh, Ryan, what is a shootout? A shootout for us is a decision-making process. It's taking couple of hopefully matched solutions and allowing a client to pick between the two. And our job is to try to make sure the client is prepared as they can be and that they're actually looking for um, for the right decision and they're trying to set up a shootout for the right reasons and then trying to make sure that everything that is part of the shootout has a best chance and the best opportunity. We don't want a a shootout that's easy. We want it to be a, a good matchup. Josh, as uh, you, you mentioned, you've been you've been a consultant, you've been an end user. As an end user, what what is a shootout about for you? I mean, ultimately, as an end user, my lens was um, what PA accomplishes my goals the best, um, and whether that's vocal clarity, whether that's um, you know coverage front to back or uniformity. Um, impact things like that, and and so um, it was really good for me to go into those types of of, of um, performance shootouts or comparisons, um, knowing uh, what were my goals, um, what you know, and 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 hopefully know um, what do I want to walk away with knowing. Right. So 
a shootout is 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 that maybe that what final step Ryan of evaluation we've we've looked at all the documentation we've reviewed the budgets we've reviewed the the visuals and now it comes down to this is solution a and solution b maybe even solution c are all great choices um what what is what is that what is the you know what are the the last little bits i i guess there's a, a question that sometimes probably comes up before that um do we always need to do a shootout or is it is it is it always necessary um, or is it really just when when there's maybe a hard choice to be made that, that you need to have a little bit of emotion to go with? Yeah, no, a shootout is not always necessary. Um, we find them useful when it's mocking up a scenario or when it's testing a new technology, a new product has come to market, nobody's heard it, they're comfortable with an option but intrigued by another. Um, that can be a useful demonstration. Um, another time is when there's um, non-technical decision makers that need confidence in a solution. So sure, a lot of it, times uh, we're comfortable with with it from a technology side, but not everyone has, has heard all this product. Sure, you say that. So like non-technical people. So I'd imagine uh, whether it's a church or a performing arts center, we have the audio staff who are probably the really informed people, maybe even biased, right? Um, you have the, the general technical staff who are aware or knowledgeable and then you have what the maybe the financial or the management staff who are not technically savvy at all but but look at the paper and say wait this costs 10 percent or 15 percent more than that why would you do that right is that maybe when exactly. you get into a shootout scenario yes yeah we've seen that um exact scenario several times uh, it's it's a good decision making tool when you can have everybody from the non-technical and unexperienced listener all the way through the highly technical to all agree and that's that's a victory in the shootout when everyone has the same opinion it doesn't yeah, happen very often I, I would imagine that uh, uh, you, you probably get some really uh, maybe uh, what would the word be intriguing answers uh, from time to time based on on uh, 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 or intriguing responses based on someone's knowledge or, or experience um, that's really really a scenario that's really interesting you know I, I always quantify shootouts or demos or competitive listens as maybe two basic classifications for me um, one I call like a design shootout or design demo and that's a scenario where where Josh proposes his design and Josh you've proposed a, a line array that's hung really high up in the air and covering the room with equal distribution and someone else comes in with another demo and it's it's a point source that's stacked on the ground they're very different solutions uh, to me, those are those are really challenging to do a shootout because you're comparing a speaker, you're comparing a design, you're comparing transducers and amplifiers and all these scenario. And and and, and I, I would imagine Ryan, you don't often see that because at this point you probably hone the design down to like a set of objectives. Is that right? Yes, with the projects that we're on, it's rare that we are vetting totally different designs at that point. Uh, if we have a design question like that, we treat it more of as a as a mock up and it's a single product as opposed to trying to do a comparison. Got it. But Josh, on your end now, especially working for L Acoustics, I, I imagine you get to scenarios where you see uh, uh, three very different solutions and they want to compare those three very different solutions. Uh, um, how often is that something you you've you've been asked to do or you've been a part of? I mean, uh, we get asked to do that quite a bit, especially in the scenarios where we don't have someone like Ryan who's helping um, the client or the end user make uh, an informed decision. Um, and so a lot of times we'll have three different integrators come in with three drastically different um, designs. And, and what the request normally from our client is, is, well, we want to hear your solution this Sunday. We want to hear the next solution the next Sunday, the next solution the next Sunday. And you know, Scott, I think I've heard you say many times, um, if you're gonna if you're gonna demo a microphone, um, do you really want to hear that microphone um, or three different microphones on three different vocalists, or do you want to hear um, that same microphone on all of the vocalists in the same day, or you know, something to that effect? Sure. And um, so that's where it becomes very challenging for us as a manufacturer, because um, if you can't vet what you want in terms of the goals of what your sound system does, then it's really going to be hard to vet the difference between the loudspeaker technologies. Right, and I think that's a perfect pivot, right? So, you know, when when we when we have solution A on Sunday one and solution B on Sunday two and solution C on Sunday three, we have very different designs. We have different times. We have different performances. We have different everything. 
And, and ultimately, a lot of a shootout is about trying to eliminate variables, right? Um, is if I want to compare two speakers, I want to get rid of some of those variables. So what I, I probably want to do is have a similar working solution, right? I want to have similar coverage metrics. I want to have similar SPL metrics or or maybe different SPL metrics if we're talking about a budget. But I want to, I want to get all those things as consistent as we can. And that leads us to what I like to think of as a performance shootout. So we're going to compare the performance of a product, not the design of a solution, right? Um, and, and that performance shootout is is really, really interesting because um, now you can say, hey, does speaker from Acoustics versus speaker from brand B or C perform better in this scenario? But to do that, we, we've got to think of, of what the objectives that matter are so we can start to control for those, right? Um, Ryan, as a as a consultant working with clients of a vast degree of expertise, I can imagine uh, uh, you probably have to do a lot of explaining or educating on what they should be concerned about. What are the, the main concerns, generally speaking, when it comes to a shootout or a performance shootout between two, two or three opposing systems? The biggest thing we try to do is make sure that it's competitive and that there's a level of consistency. A uh, shootout is a little dangerous because you're looking at a snapshot of what happens on one day and all the things that can go wrong with any manufacturer system on one single day. So we try to remove as many variables and make sure that there's adequate time and that everyone has a fair shot to have the right people and the right tools and the right level of tuning um, before we bring in the client. And then we also try to have a third party. Sometimes it's us, sometimes it truly is a third party that ends up doing a kind of a mastering of each system to try to make sure that they're all matched from a sound level wise and also from a general spectral balance standpoint got it and and josh like what um when you go into this now for l acoustics like when someone says hey i want to do a shootout um what are your questions like what are the like do you have a hit list of the top five things that you say hey we need to make sure that this is the same or or my, these are the things i want to be judged on right it, it, do you have a hit list in that scenario yeah, we do. And I think one of the first things that we have to define when we start to talk about that is wh what is the area we're covering? Um, because I've been in um, the shootouts where um, that was not defined very clearly at the beginning. And so one manufacturer is covering the entire room and another manufacturer may be covering a very small portion of just the floor instead of the balcony as well. And what happens there is we have this big disconnect between covering the entire room and hearing reverberance of an empty room versus covering a very narrow area. So I think that's one of the first things that I try to define. Um, beyond that, um, we want to really make sure that we're we are trying to compare apples to apples in terms of directivity control and things like that. And so, so what does that mean? Well, especially with um, line sources, we want to make sure that the line source is the same length. Um, and so, that doesn't mean that they have to be the same box count. Um, it just means that we want to make sure we have the same line length. Um, and, and this holds true even when we start to do um, comparative demos uh, in point sources and things like that. Um, you want a similarly, um, I guess, sized kind of loudspeaker to be able to compare one to the other. Um, and that doesn't mean that it has to be the same driver size, but that the actual output is is fairly the same. And then, and then also just Pure power is, is another thing. I mean, if you're going to compare um, uh, a Lamborghini to a Pinto, but you say that the top speed for both of them is 30 miles an hour, that's great. Um, but but ultimately, if there is a major power differential between what we're we're comparing, um, that tends to also add some some uh, challenges to the to what we're doing. And so a lot of times, those are the things that I like to try to define very quickly. Um, and uh, and to make sure that we have some kind of a, a good comparison. Sure. So you're you're talking about obviously, you know, maybe here at L Acoustics we're a bit sensitive to line source demos. Uh, we've got a bit of experience in developing and building line source arrays. Uh, and so if if you guys haven't watched, we actually have a a, a whole video on YouTube about the optimization of a variable curvature line source array. And one of the things it talks about is how the directivity changes with size, right? So especially in the lows and the mids, as the array gets bigger, the, the directivity changes quite significantly. And that's a physical property of the array, not, not something that can be EQ'd in or out. And it's I find it really important to say, hey, uh, we're going to compare L Acoustics to brand B and C for this project. Um, 
if we all hang two or three meters of line, we all agree on that. We cover from row five to row 30. We all agree on that. Now what you're hearing is the real objective difference of the speakers, right? Oh, this one has a better polar response, right? This one has better stability in the vertical. This one has better gain before feedback. You can actually really quantify that. And, and if we do that all at the same time, you don't forget what you heard last weekend, right? Um, so it's, it's all about eliminating those variables. And, and I guess once we know what the objectives are, what are we trying to define? Hey, Ryan is trying to help us figure out if we really need to spend 30% more um, to get this extra performance. Do we really need that? Well, this is a good way to find out if 30% if gets us 30% of benefit. Because if it only gets us 5% of benefit, hey, you know what? Um, let's, let's save that money and spend it on a new set of microphones instead of on a, a more expensive PA, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's all the balance that people play. So I think it's really great to, to think about how you can eliminate as many of these variables as much as possible, right? So that's time. Makes sense, right? Um, that's that's coverage. That makes sense. Position. Let's let's put them side by each. I think Josh, you had a picture of of a shootout. This is a fun one because it's L acoustics versus L acoustics. So either way, we win. Um, uh, let's see, is it up right now? There it is, right? Is that it right there? That is it right there. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So this is uh, L acoustics versus L acoustics there, um, and it's what is that, Josh? Is that Kara versus A15? It is, and yeah, so the goal in this one was actually um, that a client wanted to hear the difference because they were they were between literally these exact things, a six box array of Kara or a four box array of A15 um, with either KS28 or, or KS21. And so um, this the purpose of this was to help them understand, um, do they sound different? Do they sound the same? Is, is the extra money for Kara worth it in this scenario? Um, and, and ultimately, because of the short line length of the Kara, um, the A15 made more sense in this scenario because it could cover the room very well and was much more budget friendly in this scenario. So, Josh, you said something interesting, though. It's going to cover the room, um, but I had assume you're not in that room. So you're just doing a shootout somewhere to compare two speakers. Um, Ryan, is that normal to actually do a shootout in a different site potentially um, than, than the actual install is? Um, from our standpoint, yes. Um, Often we're working with new construction and the speaker decision is made before the building is built. So whether it's in another building on campus or in some arena that we can rent or in a parking lot, um, but it's it's very typical for the sound system to be separated from the actual room. So and, and, and I suppose that keep I suppose that's not really much of a problem because at the end of the day, you're normalizing variables, right? So in that case, um, whatever speaker you pick is going to go into the same room. So there's there's the, you've you've eliminated you can divide that variable out of both sides of the equation. Um, so it's probably OK that you do it outside or you do it somewhere here, you do it somewhere there. Are there situations where you maybe really want to be in the room like um, to to compare a couple things? Is, is that really important in certain types of events like maybe or, or not necessarily so much? For a shootout, I haven't seen it as important. If it's yeah. a mock-up to prove a system design works, particularly in a very tricky space, then a mock-up is by far the best. Sure, but makes sense. Trying to do a shootout with multiple mock-ups just adds a whole layer of confusion. <laughs> right, so so I've always been a fan when we do a shootout of not trying to worry about the little ancillary parts of the system. Not that it's not really critical to get that front fill right or that under balcony speaker right, but the, the system that's covering 80 or 90% of your seats is the one that is going to have the biggest single impact on your results, right? Um, so if we can say, hey, let's let's only mock up the main system. Our real question is brand A, brand B, and we're really concerned about horizontal stability and vertical directivity for gain before feedback. Well, we could do that almost anywhere, couldn't we? Um, yes. It could be. It could be. In, in actuality, it's probably a lot easier to do it outside in free space, where you can actually hear the direct sound a lot easier than it is inside. Um, and secondarily, it's probably a lot easier to hear it in mono versus stereo, right? Do you do you find that as well, Ryan? We have typically gone with a mono solution just from the standpoint of simplicity and fewer boxes. Um, shoe dots are resource intensive, so trying to make sure that it's it's something that can be achieved in the amount of time that's available is uh, is critical. It's all about trying to get a decision. Cool. Well, um, I got a question that came in here. I, I think it's a good time to answer it. Someone was wondering, is there an ideal temperature for a shootout? And Josh, I'll pitch this to you. Do you do you care much about like the atmospheric conditions at the time of the shootout? Um, uh, is that a, is that a big problem? 
Uh, I, I mean, I think it's something that has to be taken into account um, because if it is, uh, you know, drastically cold, I mean, just from the ability to make a critical decision, if you were very, very uncomfortable, um, I think just from a psycho standpoint, you, you really have to be comfortable to make a decent decision. And so, you know, is it a good idea to do um, one of these shootouts outdoors in Dallas in, in August? Probably not. Right, Ryan? <laughs> yeah. um, and, and and temperature and humidity has a lot to do with um, with what the loudspeakers are going to do in terms of their ability of um, throwing high frequencies, especially. And so we have to consider that, um, at least in my world, um, and probably Ryan's a lot, um, we're dealing with indoor temperature controlled spaces that are probably floating in the, um, you know, 70 to 74 degrees Fahrenheit range at a pretty nominal 40 to 50 percent humidity. Right. Um, and so it's probably best to do to do the comparative in something that that somewhat represents that. Sure. <clears throat> now, I suppose the one good thing is if if we end up outside and it's a little hot that day, at least everybody is hot that day. Right. Um, but but Josh, to your point, I think it's well said that is if we do a shootout and it's a miserable day out, it's it's either really hot or really cold or it's raining or it's snowing and we're outside. If everyone's uncomfortable, they're going to spend a lot less time critically thinking about a decision that's going to impact their their house of worship, their 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 theater, their arena for the next 10 to 15 years, I would imagine. So so uh, comfort is definitely important there. So that was a great question. Uh, once again, if you're watching us live, you've got some questions about a shootout, please don't hesitate to send them in. Um, so are there, Ryan, you do this a lot. You've probably done uh, tens, if not more, of these types of things over your, your career. Um, how do you decide, do you set up the questions that, that need to be answered for your client? Do your clients have the questions that they want answered? I mean, what what's the what starts here? Is there a chicken or an egg? Um, yeah, it, it depends. Um, there's, there's always a conversation. Sometimes we have a client that is really torn between two or three different solutions. Um, sometimes it's budget. Sometimes it's um, different opinions as far as which the right speaker is. Um, sometimes it's ID Bree offering one or two solutions and a client that is um, interested in a third. And it's it's a decision making tool. Um, a lot of times we try to bring it into how do we get um, staff and leadership and financial and, and all the different players that have a stake in the game to be able to be confident that they're making a good decision. If possible, we'll try to do that on paper and through conversations without actually going to a shootout. But sometimes a shootout is the only viable solution. Sure. And and uh, Josh, when you've been uh, uh, an owner's rep um, in this situation, um, do you try to get the owners to answer a certain subset of questions? Do you do you have a survey? What I mean, what have you seen across your spread of different roles? Um, good, bad ugly, that kind of thing. You know, I, I think one of the things that, that we have to do in an owner's rep position, or, or I'm sure Ryan has to do in the consultant position, is understand what is important to the customer. Because there's probably a reason that we've suggested system A, system B, and possibly system C. Um, and that probably didn't just come from the fact that we like these speakers, right? We believe that they accomplish the goals of what the customer is looking for. And whether that is um, you know, in a performing arts center that they want exceptional intelligibility, they want to minimize reflections, um, they want you know, consistency, all of those things. And when we start to define those things, those are the things that, I, that are really good for us to help guide the customer to a solution, um, which means that they really should judge each PA um, based on their objective goals. Um, and where, where I've seen that go very poorly is number one, where we define too many objectives um, because um, they'll say, a lot of them go up and say, well, our, our venue does everything, so it has to do everything well. Okay, well, um, we still have to maybe define this to 10 things that are in this box that are very important to you. Um, and then you have to be able to rate those. And, and therein lies um, the big thing. I think, Scott, we were talking when you, said um, we've been to comparative demos where where they had 10, uh, 10 different options, rate it one to 10. Um, and that's that's very hard to be subjective. You know, one to four or one to three is a much easier way to say, um, you know, how are we doing here? Because the, the reality is, is 
um, you're much less likely to rate everything a three if a one to three is your option. Um, but it's really hard to be subjective when you're like, is it a two or is it a three? Is it seven? Oh, man, I don't know. You know, so <laughs> I, I think I think that's when it goes off the tracks really quick, and people kind of tend to check out. I watch I watch people walk through these demos, and when they have so many things to rate and so many options to rate it at, they kind of glaze over, and and by the end, by the third or fourth track, they're just doing this yeah yeah I, I completely understand that I, I i've been there with you where where we've been to a, a demo or a shootout like this and they have you know 15 or 20 questions we have 30 different selections of music and each question has a one to ten response and you find out that everything comes back between a seven and a four you know and it, it doesn't really tell you much right um so i, I kind of like the yelp scores you know one to four stars or or that kind of scenario either it's great adequate poor or terrible you know, mm -hmm. um, and, and at least it makes people objectively make a choice. Um, I'm also not a huge fan of asking 30 questions. Um, you know, if you if you really ask people just a few questions, it forces them to really like hone in on how important something is or isn't. Um, Ryan, do you do you ever weight the responses? Like, do you say this person's response is worth a little bit more? This one's worth a little bit less? Do you keep it anonymous? Um, we try to make the client um, wrestle that and then yeah. come back to us with the decision we'll we'll guide it um, sometimes we'll help with what what the question should be often we'll talk for a bit about what you should be listening for and maybe even give a demonstration of all right we're going to listen to a track here's listen to where the hi-hat sits here listen to how far right. into the, the track you can hear re reverb and try to prep people for what they should listen for and what they shouldn't listen for um, when we can normalize coverage and quality we will when we can't we try to point out these are different that doesn't necessarily speak into the design don't make your decision based on this difference sure we'll, we'll see people try to find a difference particularly if they aren't comfortable with listing critically that's mm -hmm. what is a difference and a difference must be bad whether it's actually <laughs> is or not <laughs> right right and, and, and i think that's a great pivot into like this idea of normalization right so um you know we we, we do a shootout and we want to have the most uh, uniform response. We want to have the most difference. I mean, hey, L Acoustics has a sonic signature. It's really important to us. Um, this is the way our speakers sound. Um, what's as a consultant, what do you do in that scenario? How do you do you start the conversation with what do you do? You let the manufacturers or the the integrators decide on that, Ryan? Uh, we try to set the table where we have leveled everything that we feel like we can level without adding our own bias into it. And then we'll try to give the manufacturers um, five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever it is it, uh, for, the, for the venue to actually sell the product and explain what they've done, why they've done it, and why me. Got it. And in normalization, so to me there's right, we talked about some variables we have the size of the array if it's a line array we have what the position we can hang them in a similar spot josh i think that picture you showed them obviously hanging at a similar height mm -hmm. um we have uh um uh, what else do we have we have time so we can do the demo at the same day um we have uh, uh same content right we can we can play the same musical selection on both um, and one of the big ones is is obviously normalizing the SPL. Hey, they're the same volume or the same loudness between each other. That's that's important. But to me, the really critical one is that they're the same tuning or transfer function, right? So, um, uh, L Acoustics has a sonic signature. Everyone at this webinar loves L Acoustics sonic signature. That's why you're here. Um, but at the end of the day, that's not as important, right, as its ability to transpose what's happening on stage to the audience, right? The, the sonic signature imparted in the PA is great. It's beautiful, it's amazing. It's a great starting point. Um, but what really I wanna know is how well does that, does that microphone go through your system and come out to the speakers to my ears? And, and you're gonna change a few things to get to that, right? So, oh, thanks Josh, you threw that up there. So so this is what a normalization of two different PAs and, and that's, that's pretty well normalized, I, I would say. Ryan, I think you'd agree with that. That's pretty consistent between them. Yes. So in this scenario, we've got a L Acoustics PA and another brand, and we've made them transfer function as identical as comfortable, right? And so that means if we were to play a selection of music, one would expect that it would sound the same through both PAs. Right? And, and, and that normalization is, is quite important. So from a SPL standpoint, loudness, from a tuning transfer function, 
and then bandwidth. That's that's one that's always a question mark to me. Um, Josh, what do you feel like? Let's say uh, your system goes higher and lower. Do you think we should normalize that, or is that something we should kind of let be to show the differences? So I think I think ultimately that is a, that is a methodology thing for each individual manufacturer. And so, you know, in this picture is a good example that um, our goal was to normalize um, from basically 100 hertz to 10k. Um, and, and we went a little farther because the systems were quite equally matched in terms of low frequency. And so we tried to normalize from 40 hertz to 10k. But but ultimately, um, the stark reality is certain PAs can and can't do certain things. Um, and, and there was a choice for the other manufacturer um, to do one thing. And, and what the transfer function showed and what we heard were often were actually quite different. Um, and so we did our best to normalize between those guidelines. And I think that that works very, very well. Um, but if a manufacturer decides that, that they want or they have more bandwidth in their system, um, I do believe that that's a, that that can be a deciding factor um, because that may be good or bad in a certain venue sometimes or for a certain type of content. Right, and 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 that's 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 really cool in this sense. Um, now, what about like ancillary system subwoofers? How important is that in this normalization process in the shootout? Um, Ryan, do you do you normally just look at the full range speakers, or is it the full range with associated sub? Is it full range associated sub and maybe a fill just to demonstrate? you know, to hear consistency or, or, or so on and so forth? Uh, it depends on the scenario. Um, we often will do a full range, but not always. Um, we do like to have things matched as much as we can. So we would not want one manufacturer to bring in subs and fills and the other manufacturer to not. Um, it just, it, it's not set up for good decision making at that point. Sure. Um, so I had another question come in. I think this is a really good time because it, it, it perfectly pivots. Um, Ryan, someone was asking as consultants, do you sometimes have to take into account what happens behind the loudspeaker or, or maybe below it, right? So um, noise reduction or gain before feedback, is that sometimes maybe one of the critical questions that's being asked? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we, we look very much at the overall power response, what happens at the edges. Um, our designs and our design choices are often driven by what happens at the horizontal edge or the vertical edge. And um, we try to use that as best as we can. It's, it's sometimes surprisingly difficult to get people to walk out of the seats and onto the stage to actually listen to what's going on behind speakers. You know, Ryan, I've been on tour with some big rock acts for years uh, before I started Acoustics, and, and I, I will tell you there were several tours where I never put foot on stage as a front of house systems engineer. And there were multiple reasons for that. If the band didn't know my name, I couldn't get fired as easily. Um, so that was definitely um, one of the rationales. <laughs> Um, but but I, yeah, there were several tours I literally never went on stage, um, and and that's okay. Uh, um, you know, I think one of the interesting things, so pivot this question is, hey, do we care about what happens behind? A lot of cases, yes, right. Even if it's not a noise issue, there's not a, a retirement community behind, but there's a reflective wall. Um, and if we're indoor and the speakers are flown, it's pretty hard to get behind it, but we can still hear its impact on the sound, maybe in the venue. But the second thing is, once we normalize the front then what's behind is relative and matters, right? If you don't normalize the front response, right, then what's behind is irrelevant because you've forgotten already the fact that there's 8 dB more low end out of this PA. Oh, it's louder in the low end behind here. Of course it is. There's 8 dB more in the front. You need to you need to make the front identical and then you can actually compare the back. Um, uh, and that's a really, really great scenario to, to do that. Do you ever find out like, hey, does this line source array um, versus this distributed cluster um, behave better, worse for the the given project, Ryan. Do you compare different, vastly different concepts? Maybe not designs, but concepts. Do you, do you see that happen a lot, or is that pretty rare? It's been a while. Um, I would say probably close to ten years. But okay. back when line arrays were due, and some people were still skeptical of, of whether a line source was the right solution for for a given um, scenario. Uh, we did have a couple of uh, demos where we had point sources versus line sources. Uh, I wouldn't hold those up as being really good for decision making. It's it's very different products and there were lots of differences. Yeah, and Josh, do you um, do you see that much anymore from a manufacturer perspective? Have you done a, a shootout in the last couple of years where it was a very different concept of design? Um, uh, do you do you maybe I, I guess 
I, I've seen that, and I'll explain in a second, but I'll let you go first. You know, um, we I really haven't seen that. You know, much like Ryan, it's probably been a decade since since I've done that because more and more and more, I think we we've, we've really defined what venues are appropriate for a line source and what venues are appropriate for a point source. Um, and because of line sources and the technology that, that we as manufacturers as a whole, as an industry, have been able to progress, um, you, you very rarely see arrayed point sources any longer, right? Um, because of the inherent issues with that as a whole. Um, and so more and more, we're either comparing a point source solution or a line source solution. Yeah, exactly. I think the only time I've seen like very vastly different concepts is is only lately we've done shootouts against L Acoustics versus L Acoustics, and we've done uh, Stereo versus Aliza, right? Uh, and so uh, I know all of you, uh, Josh and Ryan, have both been a chance to hear that kind of a scenario. And what we'll do is we'll have the same amount of acoustic power, we'll have the same coverage, we'll have the same loudness, we'll have the same content, we'll just play it in, in a different format, if you will. Um, and I guess that's a shootout, right? It's a different kind of shootout, but it's a, hey, how do we normalize every possible variable as much as we can and then hear just the change of one variable, which in that case was format. We went from stereo to Eliza. Um, and, and that's a another type of a shootout in that sense as well. Of I want to I want to eliminate variables. I want to get down to the minimum, and then I want to hear the difference. And now I can go. Oh, now I can take that knowledge and expand that out to to something else. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of like different format, I guess content falls into that. Um, Josh, uh, what are your three favorite shootout songs? Oh, uh, go. Never mind. Um, <laughs> uh, is there is there you know what's your take on content? What what's your scenario? What do you recommend from a manufacturer perspective? Uh, I think first and foremost, the content should match um, what what the end user is going to use the room for, um, and I think that's a pretty big key, right? If we're if we're looking at doing um, a house of worship um, room like I like I'm in a lot, um, is it really relevant to listen to an R and B or hip hop track if the church is using contemporary Christian music? Um, probably not in that scenario, and so I think being intentional about what we use is good, and and people say a lot to me in these well i know this track right so i want to hear this track because i know this track um the hard part about that is is what is your reference for knowing this track is it your car stereo system because um almost every car stereo system in existence is like a big smiley curve right and is that really what we want um in our performance venue um and then beyond that i think having a live aspect is very very important because um if you can't hear a vocal in an acoustic guitar, and it, and it doesn't have to be a full band, I've actually found the most successful for us has been when we can just have a vocalist in an acoustic guitar sing, and we can look at the, the um, changes or the differences that we're doing in terms of EQ from one system to the other. And, and that that is only successful if you can double assign a vocal and double assign an acoustic guitar so you can make a unique decision um, for each one. Um, but that can be very telling about hey, um, we are using a vocal and acoustic guitar every week, and, and I don't have to work as hard to get what I want out of it from this PA as I do as this PA, maybe. And, and Ryan, do you do you have the same thing? Do you have a set of uh, tracks, or is that guided by the end user? Do you recommend that they have live performance on stage? We like a combination of both. Um, live performance and um, single guy with an acoustic guitar is a very powerful telling solution. Uh, we, we've had good success with that. Um, just just like you described, Josh, double patch. Um, I like to have a variety of content. Um, most of it should be um, similar to what the venue is actually using. Um, if it's house of worship, sometimes it's nice to have, um, have the, the lead pastor's voice also. Everyone is very familiar with lead pastor's voice. Uh, but yeah, yeah we, uh, there's no reason to have R&B and hip hop if they're never going to use that in the venue. Sure, that makes sense. And and, and I, I tend to agree with you guys. You know, a, a set of high quality known tracks is probably good. Um, you know, I've, I've been to a shootout and I walk in and the first thing I see them do is boot Spotify up or something like that. And, and I cringe <laughs> a little bit. Um, you know, it's it's uh, you know, I understand it's it's an easy source of music, but let's let's try to get some lossless uh, high quality music to play back. I also, I'm, I don't feel it necessary, for instance, to play the same 12 seconds of a track. Like you can just let the track roll and switch between different things. Um, 
you just have to be able to notify people of the switch because it's interesting how many shoots I've done and, and people don't seem to notice that it's switched, right? Like they don't know that there's a, a change. And I've seen this done a lot of ways. Ryan, have you seen more or less success notifying people of what's active? Yes, um, we actually built a little test box that um, we could allow, allow a listener to walk around and switch between four different systems and found that was actually um, a really interesting decision making tool once you convince people that they actually had the power to make a switch and and pick between what they were listening to. Um, but it, it needs to be organized and it needs to be clear. Um, sometimes that's uh, having somebody that's playing Vanna White and just pointing to which speaker is actually playing on stage is useful. Sometimes it's a light that lights up next to a speaker but whatever the combination is, you don't want to end up confusing people and having them make a decision based on listening to a speaker that they didn't think they were choosing. Sure, and and speaking of like like notifying the users, um, do you prefer blinded demos uh, or or is is it usually not a big deal depending on the decision makers? If everything is well matched. Um, we haven't felt the need to go to a true blind that often. Um, we have used true blind in the office when we're actually trying to pick between different amplifiers or different speakers. Um, and it's it's really intimidating to have five or six consultants all sitting there trying to pick the one that they want to pick and knowing that they don't have a chance. And we <laughs> usually end up with like a 50 50 split on on any decision. So. <laughs> You know, we actually we do the same thing at L Acoustics. If we're going to listen to a new product, um, we'll often do a, a, a demo of of this product versus the reference, right? Um, you know, I, I can think of those days when when Kara was being designed. We we actually had DVDOS and Kara side by each, and we did that a lot, right? Um, is this better, right? Uh, what what do we like about this? What do we like about that? And then you do some big tests, and you get a bunch of people together with a survey, and 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 if it's 50-50, fifty, you're not doing a very good job, right? Um, you know, uh, or I guess you've done a great job depending on what you're trying to do. You know, hey, we've adjusted a limiter setting. Do you hear the difference? 50-50. That's perfect. Great. Nobody heard the difference. Um, or, hey, we're choosing a new transducer. Is is the expensive one better or the cheaper one? You know, hopefully we, we see a good distribution there. Um, I, I definitely also, back to the point of content, I really like having uh, live actors. It's interesting when you know, everything is normalized in front of house or out in the audience as much as it can be. Those transfer functions, Josh, you're showing us, if that's the same, then what happens when I put a mic below it? I put a headset or a lavalier or a handheld mm -hmm. um, and, and does it feel different? Do I have different game before feedback scenarios? Because that's going to be a real impact on the quality of the sound at the end of the day if you have a game before feedback issue, especially in mono. And when you go to stereo or LCR, it's going to even get worse, right? So it's, it's right. a great scenario. Um, I tended to recommend, as silly as it sounds, hire an actor. Um, it, it sounds silly, but any university student will make, you know, a hundred bucks to come in and read the newspaper for you and, and do that. It's a lot better than asking the stagehand or the stage manager to do it um, because they both don't have good diction and two get really annoyed and don't know how to read uh, stuff in a, in a way that's not frustrating and annoying. Um, Ryan, I, I did a shootout with you years ago and it was great because you had that system, I think of maybe a predecessor or a prototype of it. And if I remember, you had light bars even, A, B, and C light bars. Like, was it red, green, and something? And they lit up indicating what was being listened to. Yes. Yeah, that, that was exactly the system where we had a light underneath each array and the user could walk around with a switch box and pick which one they wanted to listen to. And the entire um, rest of the, the listeners could also see what was being changed between. Yeah, that's really neat, especially I suppose if you've said to people, hey, take a listen for this feature right now. We're playing this track and you can walk back and forth and switch yourself and really hear that. Um, do you find do you, of you guys find if 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 it gets to be too many people, is it better to have 50 people judging or five people judging? Josh, have you seen uh, scenarios where it works well one way or the other? Um, I, I've seen it work well both ways. Um, I have more often seen that when we have lots and lots of people um, that it becomes hard for them to move around effectively uh, in some venues depending on how big they are um, but also you kind of get this herd mentality uh, where people start congregating and and drawing conclusions based on what their friends are saying hey what do you think and and that can be destructive in certain scenarios because um, you're always going to have a, a certain subset of people who are going to be more influential and um, if it's a scenario where they all have an equal say, but 
pastors in the room. And if pastor shows bias, um, everyone tends to follow the important guys um, bias. And so um, obviously we can't control that in a lot of scenarios, but when you can, when you can break it up into smaller groups of people who, who um, maybe are on the same level, but not, you know, and so I like having an executive team listen and then having maybe the volunteers listen separately um, because it, it, it helps you get a bit more diversity in, in the outcome. And Josh, to follow up on this, there's a question that came in, and it's a good one. Is can you talk? Can you elaborate a bit on like the house worship specific uh, purchasing decisions or just choice factors? What are the usually, if you could do a survey of everyone's top three or four things, what are the things that are most critical in that market space? You know, uh, I think vocal intelligibility is always um, paramount in that scenario. Um, you know, ultimately from stage, we're doing a disservice to ministry if what is said from stage cannot be heard um, or not be clearly heard. And so I think that's a huge deal. Um, beyond that, when we get outside of that, um, the performance, so really um, impact and coverage consistency, because in a house worship scenario, there are no cheap seats. In fact, um, what's happening at the very back row is equally as important as what's happening in the very front row. And that's sometimes a far departure from what we do from a performance standpoint, because a lot of times you go, well, they paid $12 for the ticket back there, and those people paid 2000 So we need to care more about the people up front. Um, it's, it's quite different in a house of worship scenario. And, and also, pastor tends to always sit in the worst sounding spot in the entire venue. Um, <laughs> that's, that's a given, right? And so, so coverage consistency is a really, really big deal. Um, okay. and, then, and then aesthetics tends to play in as well. Um, you know, we have video walls that are oftentimes 90 feet wide by 30 feet tall, um, and the back wall of the of the auditorium is 90 feet wide by 30 feet tall. So where do you put PA without letting it come down into the screens? And um, so I think those are the things that really impact. I mean, budget is a is an obvious, um, but more and more um, people are understanding why you why you spend money on a PA because it's a long term investment. You know, we see consoles come and go. Sure. Ryan, um, so to, to run on Josh's thing, how do you how do you work with the the church in that sense, the house of worship in that sense, to say, you know, this is your most important metric. What what should you listen for? Like, is there is there a maybe a hit list you want to like get in their brain to think about so that they make uh, the best choice for themselves? Like, if vocal intelligibility is important, what should they listen for? Yeah. Yeah, it depends on the environment. If we're in a room that is either the actual room the sound system would be installed in or something that's similar, then it's pretty easy to start um, talking about how, um, as you move further away from the array, does one array feel closer or more distant? Does one array light up the reverberant field a little bit more and, and start to draw some comparisons there, um, trying to have a, a content that is familiar and making sure that that sounds natural um, and it actually sounds like the person that's on stage um, trying to make the the sound system be as transparent as possible is is usually helpful um, and and josh you know ryan just said a good and interesting thing make the the sound system sound as natural as possible now i'm a house of worship and we've just come from 15 years with maybe not a great pa and it turns out the pastor's never sounded like himself or herself. Um, how much is that a problem? Like we have what we think is our sonic signature in our head and it's maybe yeah. not, <clears throat> pardon me, it's not something ideal. It, yeah. That's a yeah. that's a amazing hurdle actually, um, because, uh, and, and I'll go farther to say, and, and we notice this even more with worship teams, when they've gone from a, a PA for many, many years that masked all of the bad things, um, the second that they go to a modern PA, take manufacturer out of it right now, we've made such leaps and bounds in terms of bandwidth and technology that um, the first time they hear their band through a, a modern PA, it's exposing and scary. And and immediately they go, oh, I don't know, you know, there's something wrong with this. And, and they actually yearn for the days of distortion and cover up um, for that. And so that's been a huge hurdle for us um, in, in these shootouts and, and in just system selection as a whole. Do you, do you see the yeah. same thing, Ryan? Like, uh, hey, band wants to play the recorded tracks from last Sunday at this particular house of worship on um, this beautiful new PA. And it turns out it sounds not very good, right? Is that a, is that a common problem? We have certainly had that happen. Um, we try to discourage that. 
and um, it's a lot better to have worship leader and a guitar that's there where everybody can go and stand and listen acoustically and then listen to the PA and be able to say, yes, it, it sounds the same, it doesn't sound the same, and, and try to have confidence there. Um, I think if you are going to take tracks from last Sunday, you should probably have somebody clean them up and work on them and make sure that it's a good mix and you're not coming in and trying to remix on three new PAs on the same day in addition to all the other variables we're trying to cut out. It's yeah, yeah, that, that's a really good point. I, I've I've definitely been to those where where either there's uh, not enough time allocated or or someone at four o'clock for a five o'clock shootout gets the idea that we want to listen to last week's tracks. And it's a real unfortunate thing as a manufacturer. I'm like, this is a terrible idea, you know, um, because of this, this, and this. And 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 it's not that I'm trying to cover up what my PA will do. It's just you know what's about to happen here, which is that track from last week's Sunday on that old PA isn't going to transfer well um, for a million reasons, right? The tuning's not mm -hmm. the same. The sensitivity, you know, all, all those things aren't the same. So I, I totally understand that. Um, someone had a question, you know, uh, especially in certain markets, um, it's all about how loud something can get, the loudness war. Um, you know, the loudest is therefore the best. <clears throat> Obviously, if we normalize the the relative SPL, right, we can then hear systems minus their potential headroom. But how do we judge like, hey, this this system has more power? Is, is, there, is there an easy way to do that, Josh, or is it just turn it up until it, it gets loud? So I've run into this multiple times, actually, and, and uh, notably, actually, in the casino market when we were doing um, uh, shootouts uh, there that um, it was we, we went through everything and then it was, OK, well, I'm going to put on this metal track and melt faces. Um, you know, how do we how do we judge which one gets louder? Um, because an SPL meter tells part of the story, um, but what it doesn't tell is the distortion side of of how things sound. Um, and we ran into that uh, at a shootout where, where on the meter we were louder, um, but uh, the other system sounded louder because of the sheer amount of distortion in it. Um, and we basically just let both manufacturers take the system to its limit, uh, wherever they were comfortable. Um, but that also is, is dangerous because um, if you're going to drive it that hard, uh, there's always a risk that um, you could uh, ruin something, break something. Um, and so if that has to happen, it's best for that to happen at the end of the shootout. <laughs> um, and, uh, and but even then, um, it's a, just a very hard metric um, to judge uh, as a whole, in my opinion. Uh, Ryan, and, and on that topic, um, obviously that's that's a metric, right? Uh, if this system gets 3 dB louder and and it's, you know, only one dB more expensive, that's maybe a value proposition. Um, is that something you evaluate on site at the shootout or is that maybe more of a paper evaluation or a, a synthetic evaluation? Um, is there a preference here or do you end up, sometimes we got to just see which one runs out of gas first? Yeah, we like to do most of the shootout at modest levels where people can talk over the shootout and have um, not have severe listener fatigue. But toward the end, it's nice to turn up the systems and to let everybody have confidence that they do sound good when they're loud and that they get loud enough. Um, mm -hmm. I have very rarely had to turn systems up as loud as they can go and see what happens. Um, that's, that's not the market that we're playing in, luckily. Sure. We're, normally, the PA is more capable than it needs to be. Sure. Um, and I suppose it makes sense for a long-term investment for a performing arts center or a stadium or a house of worship or pretty much anybody buys a PA and expects to have it for a long period of time is it's probably important to think about where your normal operating levels will be and how much headroom you have left. Because if you're if you're within just a little margin of limit, it's probably going to have an impact on the lifespan, um, which makes sense. If, if you drive your car always just, in, just before red line, it's probably going to have a little more maintenance issues than if the old lady drives it for the rest of her life uh, at 32 miles an hour, pardon me, 50 kilometers an hour. Um, so uh, 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 last question, and then I think we'll wrap it up, um, was do you guys have any thoughts on like the, you know, the trade show type shootouts? I, I've seen them in in certain parts of the world where they have uh, two of every speaker from the world in the world. I mean, it's kind of the Noah's Ark of, of, of demos or shootouts where you hear so many things in a short period of time. Is that any value to you, you, Ryan? Does that help you at all to hear that kind of a scenario? I find them fascinating. I, uh, <laughs> WFX was one that had had numerous 
demos and I love to watch the crowd and just watch as the crowd would rotate 360 degrees every 30 minutes. Um, so sometimes they were useful to me. They're, they're not a real great comparison because you've got a wide variety and a lot of times a wide variety of different types of products and different class ranges, but it's nice to hear um, all the different products in one room. So, so that's controlled enough to be useful in itself, but it's not always a great way if you're trying to make a buying decision as much as just trying to vet products and, and see if they are something that's interesting. So it's, it's maybe that good first round of like, oh, I heard that it didn't suck, um, therefore we can think about it. I mean that in a nice way, of course. Um, it's <laughs> like, as long as it's adequate at that space, we can move on to round two, which is let's let's hone in on what fits our budget, what fits our this, what fits our that. Josh, um, you've have you been ever one of those where there's uh, 15 different speakers in a room and switching between them? Um, is, is that something that, that you find useful as a manufacturer now, as you found useful in the past as an integrator? Uh, I think my lenses in the integrator, we, we found it fascinating as well. Um, and and it was a really good way to go, okay, we're gonna dig deeper into these three products, um, knowing what you were listening for, right? I mean, understanding that one manufacturer has a point source and the next manufacturer has 16 boxes in line length. Um, you really had to go, okay, I'm gonna listen to the voicing, I'm gonna look at this, but I can't really judge directivity, I can't really judge this, you know, things like that. If you can be subjective from that standpoint, I think it was it was very useful. From a manufacturer standpoint, um, it was it became those become very hard to justify um, uh, because because things are so variable and because there are not defined outcomes and goals, um, it, it's harder to justify as a manufacturer. Yeah, I, I've always found I, I, like like you said. I mean, they're they're interesting to hear all these different gamut, but unless it's really well controlled, I'm not a big fan of it. Um, if if at the very least, okay, there's eight of us and we all have the same coverage map and we're all normalized in terms of SPL and normalized in terms of transfer function or tonality, I'm okay with it then. Um, the only hard thing then is even if each person gets 30 seconds, by the time you've listened all the way around, it's been, a, it's been four minutes. Um, and my brain doesn't remember what four minutes ago sounded like. I, I don't remember what my wife said to me, usually few, four seconds before. Um, so it's really hard to even remember what that speaker system sounded like versus this speaker system. So I, I'm totally with you um, on that. And it's hard to know who wins, right? So I guess the last question for me today is, how do you know who wins a shootout? Like, uh, what's your, Ryan, you've, you've set up this event. It's for your current project. It's A versus B. You've got the 20 most important people at the performance center. What's the perfect result for you? From our standpoint, a decision. As long as we don't <laughs> walk away with more questions at the end, it's, it's a win from a design side. Um, when possible, we'll try to group several projects together so that the manufacturers have a better chance of not walking away completely empty handed. And we've had that happen where where we've had two or three projects all share a shootout and every manufacturer's walked away with a client. Oh, that's so cool. That's that really was neat. also kind of a win from our standpoint. It's It's harder to coordinate that just because you normally don't have everybody being able to agree on the same timeline and space all at once. But but that's really interesting. The, it yeah, comes together. That's really interesting. You know, so so obviously for this particular project, this decision of this factor was the most important. And for this project, it was this factor. And this project, it was this factor, right? This one is cost sensitive. It turns out that 30% more is not worth the extra performance. This one wants the best possible performance that's ever existed and they'll spend the money for it. Fine. And this one says, hey, we really care about the aesthetics and this box comes in pink. Okay, cool. Um, so that's, I, I totally get that. That's a really neat thing. Josh, from your point, um, uh, put off your L-acoustics hat. What are you wearing right there? Okay, good. Um, uh, uh, what What's a win as an integrator? What's a win as a owner's rep? Like, what's the win there? Is it the same thing? Is it a decision? It's, I, it's a decision because it, these are so resource intensive for manufacturers, for integrators, for the end user. Um, I think if you, we've all done a disservice to ourselves um, if we can't walk away with a decision from something like this. Um, because I have been to them, and I know Ryan has, and I'm sure you have, Scott, where um, that only posed more questions. Um, and that's really bad because in one scenario, we went back and did another demo. Um, and and, and that's, uh, that's frustrating, it's tough, and it's hard on everybody. Yeah, totally, totally with you. I, I think 
the danger of a poorly designed shootout is that you'll do a shootout again, right? Like that's at the end of the day. Um, you know, if, if you do a bad job of, of normalizing, equalizing of, of all of that, at the end of the day, it's like, well, but this one sounded better in the back and this one sounded better in the front and this one, this and this, and there was no, well, that's because it was flown high and it was flown low and it was 16 boxes and it was four boxes. So mm -hmm. it's really, if you can eliminate every possible variable before you get there, it's almost impossible not to make a decision at the end, right? It might be the one that surprises you. Oh, I thought I really liked brown speakers. It turns out I like this color speakers or vice versa. Um, but to me, I, I would I would have no problem uh, winning or losing an event in that scenario because at least uh, we've, we've gone in in an honest and genuine way. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think there's any more questions coming in from the live viewers. Thank you guys if you've been watching us live today on Teams. If you're in YouTube, once again, don't forget the subscribe button. Uh, Ryan, I've put your info in that YouTube link as well. I debrief, check them out. Um, you guys are, are all over the place. Uh, you're in projects all around the world. Uh, I, you haven't flown in four months. How does that feel? It's been very odd. <laughs> it's just back to back to back and then nothing. So it's nice. Uh, I, I look forward to the day that we all can hang out in the same room again. And, and, uh, and uh, uh, Ryan, uh, next time I come to Texas, uh, I might have to stop by for some of your barbecue. I hear you're smoking meat today. I'm looking forward to uh, getting a chance to do that. Uh, Josh, it's great to see you almost in person again. Um, one of these days, <laughs> wow. we'll, we'll get to share a beer. Um, guys, thank you for the time today. Everyone who watched this live, thank you for joining us. Uh, everyone, please be safe, be healthy. Use this time to grow your knowledge uh, and uh, have a great day. Thank you.